Dr. Rico here. This is a lecture from my course, System Dynamics. The syllabus link is in the description. All right, welcome to Laplace Transforms chapter, lecture, solving input-output ODEs with Laplace transforms and their inverses. So let's begin. Laplace transforms provide a convenient method for solving input-output, which we denote I-O, ordinary differential equations, or ODEs. Consider a dynamic system described by the I-O ODE with time t, output y, input u, constant coefficients a and b, order n, and m less than n, m and n being integers, as this, time derivatives of the output on the left-hand side of the equation, time derivatives of the input on the right-hand side. Here we go. Rewritten in summation form, you never thought you would like summation form so much. Here it is, a little bit simpler. We're summing coefficients a i times the derivatives of y, where we're using Lagrange's notation. Okay, Lagrange's notation uh, begins with the primes, and then as you go to higher primes and you run out of reasonable primage, you got to switch over to this parenthetical number, which denotes the order of the derivative. Okay, so you have the sum of derivatives in y on the left-hand side and the sum of derivatives in u on the right-hand side. Okay, important to note here is that conventionally, or by convention, a n is just unity. All right. The Laplace transform L, you knew it was coming, of both sides, gives us Laplace transform, Laplace transform, to the sum itself, and then we can use linearity, the linearity property here, to bring that Laplace transform inside the summation, and also we can take each of these coefficients, AI, they're just constants, they can be pulled outside of the Laplace transform, and we have this expression here. In the next move, we recursively apply the differentiation property of Laplace transforms to yield the following. Okay, let's ignore the big messy term first. Okay, so let's ignore this I sub I term, and let's focus on the first term in the summation. We have s raised to the i of power multiplied by capital Y of s, which is simply the Laplace transform of little y as a function of s. Okay, this is the way that we typically write it, capitalized. The transform is capitalized. So we see, and this is the, the sort of key aspect of the differentiation property, for each order of the derivative, we have an s exponent, okay? s, the Laplace s, the complex frequency raised to the power of the derivative. So if you had y double prime, this would correspond to, once you Laplace transform it, and still we're focused right now on this term and not the initial conditions term, which this one over here will be the messy one. Uh, for just this term, we have s squared y of s. Okay, so this is, this is the, uh, the sum that we have for all the powers of s, all the orders of derivative. Okay, so we have this sum. And on the left-hand side, we've got that, plus this other term that we'll look at in a moment. And on the right-hand side, we have something that looks very similar. We have a sum of the coefficients times s raised to the jth power, which corresponds to the order of the derivative, again, of u of s, which is, of course, the Laplace transform of the input function of time, 
And once it's transformed, it is a function of s. The image of the transform is a function of s. So uh, the first look at this really is pretty simple. We've got this nice polynomial in s and y on the left-hand side, and this nice polynomial in s on the right-hand side with u, the input transform. Now let's take a look at this term. So the differentiation property includes initial conditions in its most general form. So initial conditions are dealt with by summing powers of s with derivatives of y evaluated at their initial condition, at the initial time, which we usually take to be zero. So we have all of these initial conditions of y, of these derivatives of y, y, y prime, y double prime, etc., increasing in uh, derivative order. And we have the s's that are multiplying here. We're summing, essentially we're reversing at the s power and the differentiation of the initial condition uh, are kind of moving in two opposite directions. So you see higher powers of s matched with lower powers of derivative and the initial condition and vice versa. So we're summing those. This term is frequently ignored because we will frequently consider only the forced response when we use Laplace transforms. However, it's also a really good way of solving an initial condition problem. So this term, if you keep it in there, is, uh, is general and we can, we can uh, use this technique to solve for both forced response and free response. Now, we're going to use a little shorthand here. We'll say that big I sub little i, where little i is the index of this sum on the left-hand side, um, is this term. And then we can sort of tuck in all of that pretty messy inner summation, okay? So we'll go ahead and take a look at uh, I sub I here, which we noted already arises from the initial conditions. Splitting the left outer sum and solving for big Y, we split the outer sum. We see that if you look at the, the terms here, we're going to have a summation of two terms that are summed. Well, you could sum them separately and sum the result, right? That is fine to do. So we split the sum into two sums. And uh, we are then able to move this term with the initial conditions in it over to the right-hand side of the equation, which we do in this first step here. So now this term has moved over to the right-hand side and it is of course subtracted here. So there's the subtraction. Okay, so now uh, we have a term with y in it. The only term with y in it is on the left-hand side. Of course, it's a sum, so it's a bunch of terms. However, all those terms have y of s in them. So you can factor out y of s, which when you're using summation notation, you can simply move that guy to the left of the sum, and you have this sum of a coefficients and powers of s. The next step is to simply divide both sides of the equation by this term. Doing so yields these two terms in the solution y of s, which is the solution in the Laplace domain, right? We have two terms. One of them is going to have a sum of b coefficients multiplied by s, powers of s. And uh, the, the denominator here, which is the same as the denominator in the second term, which just came from dividing both sides by this term up here, uh, is just, a, a, again, a polynomial in s with coefficients a. This term includes the initial conditions in it. This term has the input in it. It's the only place the input comes into our solution. Uh, and the initial conditions only enter in this term. So what we're actually looking at here are the Laplace transforms of the forced response and the free response. They've been separated out nicely in this solution. So we have derived the Laplace transform image y of s 
in terms of the forced and free responses. Still in the S domain, of course. We haven't taken any inverse Laplace transforms. For a solution in the time domain, we need to take the inverse Laplace transform of both sides, yielding on the left-hand side y of t, which is the time domain solution for the output y. And on the right-hand side, using linearity, we can simply take the inverse Laplace transform of each term separately. So this is the time forced response and the time free response, the inverse Laplace transforms of the Laplace transform images of the free and forced responses. This is an important result and it's quite general. Any linear input output ordinary differential equation can be solved in this manner. Assuming there is an inverse Laplace transform, assuming you can find that inverse Laplace transform, and assuming that U has a Laplace transform, okay? So this is a really nice general result. And uh, this is many people's preferred way of solving linear ordinary differential equations. Okay. Let's take a look at the example. Consider a system with step input u of t equals seven times the unit step input. Output y and input output ODE second order using newtonian derivative notation because why not we like it y double dot plus two y dot plus y equals two u solve for the forced response y forced with laplace transforms okay so from that big result that we got sol dot six that equation we can take just the first term which is the inverse Laplace transform of y force, which is the Laplace transform of the forced response. The forced response Laplace transform we found in equation sol.5d, which was just this ratio of polynomials in S times u, the Laplace transform of the input. Now, we're actually going to give this a name soon see if you can guess what it is very soon okay now we'll just simply substitute in what that ratio of polynomials in s is in this problem which is to say we read off the coefficients of the right hand side which were b in our general expression b zero here times u, the, the zero with time derivative, or no time derivative at all, of u. And that is, uh, uh, so two is b zero, s to the zero corresponds to no time derivative at all, s to the zero is just one, and we're left with two times one in the numerator. The denominator comes from the left-hand side, of our original input output ODE. The coefficients are one times, it's going to be S squared. The second time derivative becomes the power of S. So we have S squared plus two S to the one. So two S plus one S to the zero or just one. We still haven't done anything with this input u of s, which we're now going to turn to. We can Laplace transform u of t for u of s, taking the Laplace transform of u gives us, remember u was seven times the unit step so using linearity, we can pull the seven out front. The unit step, the Laplace transform of the unit step is one over S. It's a very easy one to find in the Laplace transform table. So we are left with seven over S as the Laplace transform of the input. So now we're ready to substitute that in up here. 
Returning to the time response, now armed with the input U of S, the forced response then is going to be the inverse Laplace transform of the expression that we had previously, now with seven over S inserted for U of S. We can use MATLAB's symbolic math toolbox function part frac to perform the partial fraction expansion because we won't be able to find a, an inverse Laplace transform in the table that applies directly to this expression. So we use the partial fraction expansion in MATLAB part frac and we get this expression or looking at it in a little nicer form we get this. Now we see that the terms are additive and additive terms are easy to use the inverse Laplace transform with because we can apply linearity. So we can apply the inverse Laplace transform to this. And again, linearity tells us that we have the inverse Laplace transform of each of these terms separately. And the first one is the inverse Laplace transform of one over S. Well, we already know that one from this very problem. We did it the other direction, right? We took the Laplace transform of the unit step function and we got one over S. We do the inverse of the one over S to get the unit step. The inverse Laplace transform of this fraction, looking into the table, it's right there. It's T e to the minus T, e to the minus one T. The third expression, one over S plus one, is just an exponential e to the minus one t. So we've got the three inverse Laplace transforms combined in the same linear combination. And we can simplify that slightly. e to the minus t shows up in both terms. We factor it out to here. And we're pretty much done. So the force response starts at 0. Looking at this, when time is zero, um, on the plus side at least, uh, this is equal to one, this is equal to zero, this is equal to one, it's one minus one, which is zero, so it starts off at zero, which matches our initial condition, right? Initial condition for a forced response is going to be zero, so that makes sense. And if we look at uh, when time increases quite a bit, this entire term will be drawn down to zero with this exponential. Negative exponential in time is going to dominate this t. t grows, but an exponential is going to dominate it. So uh, we end up with this term diminishing to zero as time gets large. And we're left with 14 times the unit step for large time is just going to be 14. And so it starts off at zero and decays pseudo exponentially it's actually not a perfect exponential to a steady 14 and that is how to solve an input output ordinary differential equation with laplace transforms for the forced response we didn't apply it to find the free response we could have included an initial condition with this problem actually too because it was second order and we could have solved for the total response or the free response um, in either case uh, we just decided to go with the forced response which is probably the most common case when you're using Laplace transforms to solve for the response all right that's all I've got for you today see you next time